Great. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, my name is Jonathan Simons. I'm the Head of Education at Policy Exchange. Um, it's fantastic to see so many people here for this uh, last education event of this Parliament. Uh, I think it's safe to say that we've been building up to a peak uh, with this event uh, from Right Honourable Alan Milburn, who we're delighted to have here. Um, in his new book, The Old Boys, uh, David Turner tells us that 7% of boys who went to uh, Wickham between 1910 and 1919 married sisters or daughters of boys who went to Wickham. Uh, and the most common reason for Wickham boys to get divorced from Wickham girls was when they co-named other Wickham girls in their divorce papers. Uh, despite some wobbles in the 18th century, uh, during which Shrewsbury was down to 26 pupils, St Paul's was down to 35 pupils, uh, and there was a pupil rebellion at rugby, which was put down at sword point by the local militia. Uh, it is safe to say that the private schools have perhaps never had so much of a domination uh, as they do today. Uh, and obviously, this is one of the topics we're here to talk about today, which is the role that education plays in social mobility, not just the independent schools, of course, uh, but also the way in which all the state schools uh, play in social mobility. Alan Milburn, as, as you'll all know, is the former cabinet minister, MP for Darlington between 1992 and 2010. Um, in amongst his many achievements uh, from 2009, he was the chair of the panel on the fair access to the professions, which uh, made a series of I think I can say, because I was in government at the time, a fairly crunchy series of recommendations on what might be done to open up uh, some of those more traditional professions uh, to people from all backgrounds. And since July 2012, of course, he's been chairman of the Social Mobil Mobility and Child Poverty Commission. Uh, and we're delighted to have him here today. Thank you. The way that the event is going to work uh, is that Alan is going to speak for about 25 or 30 minutes, uh, and then we're now going to have two expert responses. Uh, the first response is going to be from Lizzie Pittman. Lizzie is a former advisor to the Department of Education, a former associate director of the New Schools Network, and indeed a founding leader of the international education company Tribal Group, uh, which she set up and acted as a communications director for. Uh, and then Leslie Davis is going to also give a response. Uh, Leslie Davis is vice president of quality and standards and research at Pearson, who are our sponsors of today's events. We're very grateful to them for doing so. Uh, Leslie is responsible for the quality of all qualifications that come out under Pearson's name. So Alan's going to speak. We're going to have two expert responses, and then we'll have plenty of time to open it up for questions and answers. Uh, but with great pleasure, it gives me to invite Alan Milburn. Thank you. Uh, well, I'm delighted, first of all, that there are some experts on the panel, so that's, uh, uh, <coughs> that's always useful. I don't know whether, in truth, whether or not um, you've been building up to this uh, event, or whether you're now scraping through the bottom of the barrel, but anyway, <laughs> it's, the last, uh, it's the last policy exchange event pre-Perda, since I know, I think we all know where we, we're heading uh, over the course of the next few weeks. Quite where we will end up is an entirely different kettle of fish, um, but more of that in a moment or two. Uh, so thank you to Policy Exchange for, for organising today's event, for Pearson for uh, sponsoring it, and, and for most of importantly of all for you to spend your lunch times uh, with us here today. Uh, <clears throat> I want to talk principally. I'm going to talk about education, but I actually want to talk principally about schools. Uh, so I think you know one of the great things about Brit being British. Um, I think we can still just about say that, it's pre the election, um, is that um, it's part of our DNA that everyone should have a fair chance in life. That's sort of part of what it means, I think, to be British. Yet we know all too often that uh, demography is destiny in our country. Uh, being born poor often leads to a lifetime of poverty. Poor schools ease children into poor jobs. Disadvantage and advantage cascade down generations. The truth about our country is that over decades we have become a far wealthier society, but in truth we've struggled to become a fairer one. The global financial crisis brought those concerns to the fore. In its wake, a new public consensus has begun to emerge that unearned wealth for a few at the top, growing insecurity <coughs> for many in the middle, and stalled life chances for those at the bottom isn't really a viable social proposition for Britain. So as birth rather than worth has become more and more recognized as a key determinant of life chances in our country, higher social mobility, reducing the extent to which a person's class or income is dependent on the class or income of their parents, has become the new holy grail of public policy across the political spectrum. That is a development that I regard as most welcome. Of course, there is no single lever that on its own can make a nation more socially mobile. No single organization can make it happen either. 
All sorts of things make a difference. Individual aspirations as much as parenting styles. Family networks as well as career services. Career development opportunities alongside university admissions procedures. But the global evidence suggests the key is education and employability. Social mobility for my generation speeded up in the 1950s largely thanks to a big change in the labour market. The shift from a manufacturing to a services economy, if you like, from blue collar to white collar, drove demand for new skill and opened up new opportunities for millions of women and men to step up and get on. Social mobility has slowed down in the decades since, primarily because of another big change in the labour market, the move to a globalised, knowledge-based economy. Since the 1970s, technological change in this and other developed countries has been skills biased. People with higher skills have seen large increases overall in productivity and pay, while those with low skills have experienced reduced demand for labor and lower average earnings. Those with qualifications tend to enjoy greater job security, higher levels of prosperity, and better prospects of social advance. Those without skills find it hard to escape a twilight world of constant insecurity, endemic low pay, and if we're honest, little prospect of social progress. Bridging that divide is the key to healing social division in our country. As our economy becomes ever more reliant on high levels of skills and education, they will become the most crucial motors for more social mobility in the future. And here, a genuine national <coughs> effort is needed. The Prime Minister used to be fond of saying, I don't know whether he still is, that we're all in this together. And to that extent, I agree with him. Employers can help by establishing stronger links with schools and colleges. Voluntary organizations can help by raising aspirations and mentoring pupils. Career services can help by providing inspiration and encouraging ambition. Colleges can help by leading efforts to make vocational education as attractive as an academic one. Professions and universities can help by ensuring that recruitment practices are genuinely open and totally fair. But it is what happens in schools that will have the greatest influence on Britain's prospects for social mobility. Study after study, not just in this country but around the world, has come to the same conclusion. Time spent in education, including the vital early years, is the most important determinant of future social status, and success in schools is the most important factor determining social mobility. That is why Education must be a top priority for our country, including when it comes to where our government spends our money. In the UK, our education system is characterised by world-beating centres of excellence at every level, from primary through to higher education. The last 15 years have seen major changes, in particular, in what our schools do and what they achieve. It is worth remembering that GCSE and A-level results have risen dramatically, more students than ever before, including those from low-income families, now go on to university. And there has been a welcome new focus on improving the early years of children's lives. There has been progress, too, in narrowing the education gap between poorer children and their better-off classmates. Over the last decade, the proportion of children eligible for free school meals who achieved five good GCSEs, including English and Maths, has almost doubled. So that is progress, but not nearly enough. Unfortunately, it is tempered by the long tail of education underachievement that still characterizes our education system. Far too many young people from disadvantaged backgrounds still leave school without good qualifications, and the gap between poorer kids and others remains unacceptably high. Perhaps unsurprisingly, children in the most deprived parts of the country are still over 20% less likely to attend a good or outstanding secondary school than those in the least deprived areas. Children eligible for free school meals, the bottom sixth in our society, suffer a triple whammy of educational disadvantage. They arrive at primary school, first of all, less ready to learn than their peers. Less than half achieve a good level of development at age five, compared to over 60% at 
of their better off classmates. Fewer than two in three of them then leave primary school at the expected level in reading, writing, and maths, compared to four in five, again, of their peers. And they then leave secondary with two thirds of them, two in three poorer kids, not achieving five GCSEs, including English and maths, compared to around a third of children as a whole. The risk of ending up in poverty as adults is much greater as a result. And perhaps it is no surprise that poor kids are four times as likely to become poor adults as other children. Something is going badly wrong when research we have undertaken as a commission shows that low ability children from wealthy families overtake high ability children from poorer families during school. Poorer students who achieve excellent results in primary schools fall behind more advantaged students with similar results during secondary. If poorer children getting level five in English and maths at age 11 followed the trajectory of similarly attaining children from better off families, over 2,000 more would go to an elite university each year in our country. Now, in my view, it is not just a social injustice that poor children do less well at school than others. It is a moral outrage, and it has to change. For many decades, it was widely accepted by government and the public alike that when it came to learning, <coughs> deprivation was destiny. Better off children would naturally excel, poorer kids would naturally fall behind. We now have extensive evidence, international and domestic, that that form of social determinism is plain wrong. Countries as different as Canada, Poland, Singapore have demonstrated a great track record in raising the attainment level of their poorest children. In England, when I first started in politics, London used to have amongst the worst state schools in the country. Today, they're amongst the best. London outperforms every other region of Britain when it comes to getting good results at both GCSE and at A level. As importantly, children on free school meals in London schools do 35% better at GCSE than free school meals children in any other region of our country. Now, some have said that is all down to the ethnic mix in London schools. Our research suggests that only 20% of the so-called London effect is explained by that factor. Most of it is down to earlier improvements that took place in primary schools and to London schools finding ways of pulling together to drive sustained improvements in results. London, whatever the explanation, explodes the dangerous myth that all too often has dominated policy and practice both in the political and in the education world. But schools serving disadvantaged communities inevitably cannot overcome the very real challenges they face. <clears throat> that is wrong. Of course, schools in poorer areas have a tougher time than schools in better off areas. It's self-evident. And they need more help, including from government. Getting the thrust of education policy right will help schools to get it right. But frankly, schools can do more to help themselves, regardless of who is in charge, either in the town hall or in Whitehall. We published a report last year cracking the code, looking at what schools in disadvantaged areas are doing. Some are doing far better at overcoming the challenges they face than others and are helping far more poor children to succeed. There are frankly shocking gaps in performance between similar schools serving similar communities with similar intakes of poorer pupils. Across England as a whole, the best performing schools in those areas are helping three times as many disadvantaged children to achieve five good GCSEs, including English as maths, as schools with similar levels of disadvantage. If even half of that gap is closed, almost 25% more disadvantaged children a year would be getting five good GCSEs. Now these are pretty unpalatable findings. 
but ones in my view it is important to confront. All schools should be aspiring to be better than they are and as good as they can be. The same is true for individual teachers. Polling of more than 1,100 teachers that we carried out last year found that most, thankfully, have high expectations of their pupils. But one in five agreed that their colleagues at their primary school have lower expectations of students from disadvantaged backgrounds. In secondaries, the number rose to 25%. A majority of those respondents agreed that colleagues' lower expectations of students from disadvantaged backgrounds does adversely affect those students' outcomes. Now, as a commission, we take the view that head teachers and governors have a responsibility to ensure that every teacher in every school, everywhere, has uniformly high expectations of their students, regardless of their background. Our polling suggests that while the vast majority of teachers do expect the best from every pupil, regardless of background, in some schools, low expectations of disadvantaged students remains a real problem and helps to hold those children back rather than moving them ahead. Some schools, then, have managed to prove that deprivation needn't be destiny. They've cracked the code on how to improve social mobility by helping disadvantaged children to excel in education. The code-breaking schools seem to be following some simple rules that others can emulate. They use the pupil premium strategically to tackle the barriers to attainment, they build a high expectations culture, they incessantly focus on the quality of teaching, and they're prepared to adopt tailored approaches to engage parents. Critically, they seek to prepare students for life, not just for exams. If some schools can do these things, it doesn't seem unreasonable to ask the question, why can't others do likewise? So, there are some things that are within a school's control. Other things are not. How schools are funded and how they're structured, how schools are assessed and how teachers are awarded. These are in the gift of public policy and ultimately of politics. They're in the gift of you in a few weeks' time at a general election. Some of the reforms that this government and the previous government made are, in our view, steps in the right direction. But progress overall is too slow and much more needs to be done to level the playing field. So we believe the next government should focus on four key areas of reform. First, making the narrowing of the attainment gap a far higher national priority for schools, for early years, for councils, and yes, for parents. For decades, the priority in schools has been to raise standards for all children. That policy is working, and it must continue, but on current trends, it could take 30 years before the attainment gap at GCSE between pupils who are entitled to free school meals and their better off classmates even halved. We do not believe the next government should settle for that. Much more needs to be done, and far more quickly. The introduction of the pupil premium and other reforms are positive steps in the right direction. But we do not believe that so far, efforts to narrow the attainment gap within schools are being given equal priority to the focus that has been in recent decades <coughs> on raising the bar, improving the standards of all schools. For us, it's not a question of either or. It should be for all schools both. We look to the next government to give them equal billing through the standards it sets, the inspection regimes it sanctions, the league tables it publishes, and the reward mechanisms it deploys. And just as previous governments have set targets to raise the bar in schools, we look to the next government to set new targets to narrow the attainment gap. We wanted to aim to eradicate illiteracy and innumeracy by 2025 in primary school children. By then, it should have been on course to halve the attainment gap between children entitled to free school meals and their peers in secondary schools. 
That would mean within five years, at least 50% of children on free school meals throughout the country achieving five good GCSEs. That is what London schools actually manage to do today. It is what schools in every part of the country should be doing within the next five years. Second, helping schools collaborate to drive improvement. Greater autonomy for schools has undoubtedly brought about improvement. The early academies in particular managed to sim simultaneously drive up standards and close attainment gaps. But the global evidence suggests that schools also need to be able to pool expertise to help that process of improvement. That is what the London Challenge did and is what some other regions, including my own in the Northeast, are now seeking to emulate. But across the country, the current architecture for helping schools to collaborate is complex and confused with both local authorities and regional school commissioners playing on the same pitch. The next government should clarify who is doing what and make area-based school improvement programs the norm across the country. Third, helping schools do more to prepare young people for the world beyond school. Getting good exam results is critical, but in today's labour market, let alone the future one, they will not be enough on their own to guarantee success. Employers are looking for good character skills as well as academic ones. We know that these are skills that schools can help to nurture. Some do, many don't. Similarly, too often careers advice is seen as an afterthought for state schools. It has been to allow to wither on the vine, and in our view, it desperately needs to be revived. The same is true for work experience. Less than half of British youngsters have access to a high quality work experience placement, compared to 85% of kids in, in France and 61% across the whole of Europe. So we believe the next government should develop a new outcomes-based means of assessing school performance so that schools focus harder on the quality of extracurricular activity, of character development, and of careers guidance. And Ofsted should inspect schools for the quality of those services. Fourth, and in our view most critically, the next government should give far greater impetus to improving teacher quality in disadvantaged areas. It is this factor that in our view can make the biggest difference and that I now want to spend a moment or two exploring. Excellent teaching has a stronger positive impact on those from disadvantaged backgrounds than other kids. High quality teaching can add as much as 18 months of learning to a disadvantaged pupil compared to six months provided by a less good teacher. In other words, the difference between a really good teacher and a less good one can be a whole year of learning. Evidence also tells us that children from less advantaged backgrounds do not have their fair share of teaching time with excellent teachers. According to Ofsted data, around 36% of children in deprived areas are taught in secondary schools that require improvement or are inadequate. Only 13% get teaching that is classified as outstanding. Children eligible for the pupil premium are more likely to attend school, whether it's primary or secondary, that require improvement and less likely to attend schools that are outstanding. Our country suffers from a divisive postcode lot lottery in schooling that condemns children from disadvantaged backgrounds to be far less likely to experience an excellent education than their better off peers. Now, there have been some good initiatives. Initiatives like Teach First, <coughs> School Direct, Teaching Schools and the Future Leaders Trust are welcome steps designed to correct this imbalance by getting more good teachers into struggling schools to help poorer pupils achieve higher levels of attainment. But the truth about these initiatives is that they lack scale and a piecemeal. The next government should do far more to ensure that the best teachers can be recruited to teach in the most challenging schools. Last year, the Commission's survey of over 1,000 teachers suggested that better pay would be a powerful incentive to do so. 
For decades, national pay systems have rewarded teachers equally, whether they teach in a wealthy leafy suburb or a depressed coastal town. National pay bargaining is not helped to narrow the attainment gap. The old orthodoxy isn't working and in our view is in dire need of reform. The current government's laissez-faire approach of giving schools more freedom and then sitting back to see what happens isn't working either. Academy schools already have the freedom to change P teachers' pay rates, but research carried out in 2012 suggests that two-thirds of them hadn't used their freedoms to change pay or conditions, and frankly, they had no plans to do so. School autonomy remains a key driver for improvement, but in our view, the next government should step in to make a reality of the notion that the best teachers should be paid more to work in the most challenging schools. We propose three reforms. It should task regional school commissioners to ensure that academies are focusing on improving teacher quality, and where they're failing to do so, they should have the power to stipulate that some of schools' pupil premium funding, which by the way, is now worth almost thousand pounds a year for pupils in years seven to 11, should be spent on rewarding good teachers and attracting new ones with higher rates of pay. Next, on assuming office, the next government should immediately commission the school teachers pay review body to create new pay grades for the best teachers to work in challenging schools in the hardest to recruit areas. And finally, it should pilot what we call a teacher's pay premium, costing £20 million a year and funded from university-wide in participation budgets to offer 2,000 of the best teachers a 25% pay uplift if they agree to teach in a challenging school. Of course, improved pay alone may not be enough to get younger teachers in particular to areas of the country which are less attractive locationally than cities like London in which to live. So the next government should look to do something else, to introduce new career incentives alongside pay incentives to make a spell in the school in a disadvantaged town far more attractive. And here, I hope the next government will consider two proposals. First, it should ensure that new models of schools, whether they're free schools or academies, are better focused in disadvantaged areas and on poorer pupils. These schools are capable of bringing innovations in how children are taught, so providing rich development opportunities that can act as a pull factor for high quality teachers to work in deprived areas. Second, the next government should also consider introducing the equivalent of a teaching fast stream. Its aim would be to get young teachers to senior positions quickly by allocating them into job roles that develop their essential skills. One of the conditions for rapid promotion for these education fast streamers would be to spend time teaching in a disadvantaged school. So there are many things that drive social mobility and that can make our country fairer. Today I haven't spoken about the role played by early year services or by universities or what employers and professions could do to open their doors to the widest pool of talent. I focused instead on schools, and I've done so because what happens there will determine whether the promise that exists to make Britain a fair and more open society can truly be realized. There are many things, in my view at least, that are going right in our schools, but we have to be honest about what is wrong. We can no longer tolerate an education system that produces a cohort of youngsters who simply lack the skill to compete in the modern labor market. The changing nature of our economy demands that every child must be given better opportunities to learn and choose careers. In my view, it will be impossible to make progress in improving social mobility or tackling child poverty until the education attainment gap between less well-off and better-off children is closed. Our future success in a globally competitive economy relies, in all, relies on using all of our country's talents rather than just some of it. In the end, the reason I'm optimistic, you wouldn't be optimistic, you wouldn't be doing this if you were pessimistic, believe me, is because I don't believe that the fundamental problem 
in our country is that it is somehow ability that is unevenly distributed. It is opportunity. We will not create a mobile society unless we create more of a level playing field of opportunity in Britain. That has to be core focus for all of us, for businesses and councils, for our universities, for our colleges, and for our schools. It also has to be core business for our government too, regardless of who wins the next general election. Thank you. so much and thank you for clearly having read everything that policy exchange has written over the past five years. <laughs> um, I'm delighted now to invite Lizzie to, uh, to give a response. Lizzie. Thank you very, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I I want to concentrate on, there's, there's so many things that Alan's raised that I would like to, 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 to talk about at some point if I don't mention them in the next few minutes. I hope we can perhaps return to some of the other points about your recommendations because I think what's, what's helpful about what this report has done is it's produced a lot of consensus. I think I don't agree with all of Alan's recommendations because I think he has overlooked one of the most important factors of our success in terms of school improvement and that's because there hasn't been an enormous amount of central prescription. We have allowed schools to find their own way in the, with, to, to dealing with these very difficult, difficult, intractable issues, particularly dealing with, with children from disadvantaged backgrounds. And I, I haven't seen that reflected in either what Alan has said today or indeed in the report. So I, I'm, I'm not signing up to, to all of his recommendations, but I am saying that he's covered an awful lot of things that I was going to say, only said them better. So I, I, I'm just going to crack on with the, with the two very detailed points I wanted to make, um, which I think are just so important to this uh, subject. So consensus is agreed. The early, the early years are absolutely critical. Um, and really, by the end of Key Stage, key stage 2, the evidence suggests that children that can read, write, and well will do well. The consensus also is on improving the quality of teaching. So I suppose that the point I wanted to just to, to elaborate on is this, is, is this high expectations point, which it seems to me to be, it, it, we talk about it a lot, but it's not, in, it's not yet in our DNA in terms of school improvement. And I think we can't move the dial <coughs> until it is. If you haven't had the chance to read Professor Tim Oates's review of the national curriculum, uh, and I urge you to, not, not least because it is by far the most elegant piece of prose to, to emanate from the DfE in, in recent years, but because it is so, so clear and persuasive on this point. And the main conclusions of his study of the most successful jurisdictions anywhere in the world, whether it's the Confucian countries, Finland, regions of Australia, Canada, New Zealand, is that they all adopt the same starting point. No child is allowed to fail, no child needs to fail. And their schools share a collective sense of possibility. Whereas countries such as America and the United Kingdom, he notes, often find reasons why failure is inevitable, even acceptable. And in Finland, he, he uses this example, in Finland, if a child is doing very badly, his or her group of teachers draw one of two conclusions. Either the student's not working hard enough or the teacher is not working hard enough. In fact, a teacher in Finland might be expected to provide an extra third of overall teaching time uh, for remedial lessons in literacy and numeracy. And he's not saying that there aren't lots of schools here that share those characteristics. Obviously, there are. Just that it is not embedded in our teacher DNA in quite the same way. My second point is that data really matters. It really matters if we're going to crack on with the heavy lifting and finish the job. Now, a long time ago, I was really delighted to hear Alan mention the London Challenge because I was involved in setting up the London Challenge. And I think it's, it's reasonable to claim that it probably remains the single most effective program of sustained school improvement in the last 20 years or so. And the lesson of the London Challenge, which Alan alluded to, but if I just may just 
make it absolutely crystal clear what I think the main lesson of the London Challenge was, was that you need the performance data to make the case for change. And for the first time, really, data was compiled to show that if some schools were doing much better than others with a similar cohort of students, then significant improvements were possible. The point, point made clearly, very clearly by Alan. The second point, I think, is just as important. Because this evidence and the way that we presented the evidence uh, and the way we designed the programme, far from demoralising teachers, it generated a sense of both optimism and urgency about what could be changed. And I think looking forward five to ten years, we do need to rediscover both that sense of optimism and sense of urgency if we're going to mobilise a really effective teacher-led national school improvement campaign, which is what we need to do now to finish the job. And, and urgency is also, you know, I, I mean, I agree with Alan. I mean, I think the idea of, of moving towards a 20 or 30 year target on some of these things is simply unacceptable. In fact, I, I mean, I, if I have a criticism of, of, of Alan's report on GCSE uh, grades, I would say that five grade C GCSEs um, is a somewhat underwhelming target. Uh, and I'd be interested to know why the Commission thinks that only half of children on free school meals can achieve this by 2020, or indeed two thirds by, by 2025. I mean, a, a great many youngsters, and I've got teenage children, they, so they talk about these things. I mean, a great many youngsters of completely average ability would not even mention a C grade on their CV because they would think of it as a failure. And I'd like to understand why we can't put that figure at 100%. So what else can we do in the short term to move the dial on social mobility? Well, I mean, as I said, I hope we return to some of the policy recommendations that, that Alan mentions. But I, I would, if I wanted to, if I was Secretary of State on the 8th of May, and I wanted to do some things which could really hit the ground running in the next 24 to 36 months, I would do four things. I would fast track the setting up of more selective sixth forms to increase Russell Group places from, from the maintained sector. Now, that some sixth forms in the maintained sector are doing this totally brilliantly. I mean, schools like, like um, Peter Simmons and, and Hills Road are getting as many young people into Oxford as Eton. But, uh, but what, we all, what we have now is some new entrants. We have the Harris Westminster School down the road, and we have the London Academy of Excellence, which I know quite a lot about because I was involved with, um, with developing some of the ideas behind that. And if I may just talk to you briefly about the London Academy. Um, the London Academy is, is in Newham. Uh, it's one of the most deprived boroughs, as you know, in the country, not just in London. It's been set up by a group of independent schools. Brighton, Eton and Highgate, mm -hmm. and it's, it's chaired, the governing body's chaired by the, the former head of Harrow. Now, in year one, it's going, going to its third year now, in year one, 400 students applied for 200 places. In year two, 600 students applied for 200 places. In year three, this September, 2,000 students applied for 200 places. And it's now the top performing sixth form in the country, doubling the number of children going to Oxbridge and Russell Group from the whole borough, just in one school, offering 200 places has doubled the whole, the whole quota of the borough. So I think, Vice Secretary of State, I think there's a, there's a deal to be done with the independent, independent sector. I think it's a mistake to go to war with the private sector. I think it's unnecessary. I think they are happy to do more. They're doing a lot, but they haven't really found their way, and they don't really know how to help. Now, they've found their way by, by, by getting involved in, in selective sixth forms, and I think they could be asked to get involved in a very big way in the next five to 10 years. And I think that would be a, a very practical way of involving their assets and resources and, and accelerating, uh, accelerating places into, into Brussels Group and, and Oxbridge. Second thing I would do is I would, I would introduce, um, and you could do this, the government wouldn't have to do this, but you could facilitate it, peer-to-peer -peer subject knowledge summer schools. I mean, I think teachers are often embarrassed that they don't have deep subject knowledge and actually, I think for some teachers, this is a source of, of, of professional anxiety. Um, and the good news is I think the problem can be relatively inexpensively sorted out in a, in a constructive and collegiate way. But, but teachers, I mean, all professionals need, need CPD. I think teachers really do need it more than any other profession. The third thing I would do is introduce, um, and I suggested to teach first, but they're still yet to leap on my idea, is introduce teach last. 
and it would do exactly what it says on the tin, bring older and retired professionals into teaching, particularly in subject shortages. And we, and we really do need that. If we're going to raise, we're going to raise standards, we need more teachers, particularly where we have subject shortages. And finally, this is, sorry, this is, this is boring but important. We need very clear and useful guidance for governors explaining exactly what schools should be achieving uh, and helping them ask the right questions. And there's no point having a glittering board of, of investment bankers uh, if actually they don't know the right questions to ask. So those are some of the things I would do in week one. There's plenty of other things that Alan would do. I'm sure Leslie would do some other things as well. Um, I wouldn't necessarily do all of the same things, but I'm actually very optimistic. I'm probably more optimistic than Alan is. I think you know our ratings, our international ratings are respectable. I think the attainment gap is closing. It's not closing fast enough. And I go back to my original point, is you have to stop the gap from opening up to start with. Thank you very much. And now to Leslie for her response. Well, I'm delighted to be here today, not just because I'm representing Pearson, but um, in my personal life, I do a lot to work with those young people from disadvantaged backgrounds um, because I think we owe it to them to really do the most we can to get them into a career further and higher education. So I actually don't disagree with any of think either of the previous speakers have said, and there's been a concentration on schools, which is important. But I'm going to comment from the report really on what I see as opening doors and the access, you mentioned it, Lizzie, to higher education, um, particularly for students that don't go down the traditional academic route, which in this country is still an issue. And in the report, um, you know, it's very clear that what we need to do, along with building up the capability of teachers in schools, is to take the blinkers off of some of the admission practices in higher education. So I'd, I'd like to focus on that from the report. So um, many of you will know that as Pearson, we own the BTEC vocational qualifications, and they play a huge part in the system of vocational education in this country. And as you can probably see from the leaflets on your chairs, we're very proud of the contribution that our schools and colleges make to social mobility and how they use BTEX to help students to reach their potential and move on to great jobs or into higher education. And in fact, if you look at some of the new academy chains, they are offering a range of academic and vocational courses for young people to open up opportunities. Not all young people learn in the same way and we have to nurture their own style. However, as the report highlights, we have much more to do. Universities need to continue to do more to recruit young people from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. Um, and we've made it a priority in Pearson to build world-class qualifications that equip young people with the skills they need to be competitive in the global economy, but also that they have a recognized qualifications that opens doors and prepares them for higher study. And that chimes with what Ali was saying about a rounded individual, because it's not just, as Alan said, about a qualification, although that's needed um, even to put on your UCAS form if you want to go on into higher study. But we don't want to see a system where half our young people go to university and the other half are pushed down a route with no hope of ever going on to higher education or fulfilling their potential. <coughs> Therefore, the option of going on to higher education or study at the highest level has got to be possible from the vocational routes, which don't always get good press and are well accepted, rather than just from the academic study routes. So I think we've got a big challenge still in the UK to ensure that both these routes open up future opportunities and not close doors. And I do think we've got a lot of work to do there, especially from those that have come down a vocational study route. So Alan and the Commissioner's report make it clear that a significant, significant number of our leaders now decision makers and those that are leading our country actually had strong academic backgrounds. They come mainly, over 50% in some areas, from the private sector. And that's great, but it means we need to double our efforts, I think, to work with leaders, decision makers and universities to ensure they recognise the value of vocational pathways and they recognise it for the excellence it gives and the opportunities to springboard into higher education because we don't want 
that only to be for those that have studied academic qualifications. So I appreciate we've talked a lot about GCSEs. They are valuable, but the world doesn't end with the GCSE. There's more that we can equip our young people with, even at 16, and university technical colleges, general further education colleges, recruiting at 14 now, start young people on a dual route. I think it's worth pointing out as well that we're not starting from scratch. As Lizzie said, there's lots of good work that's going on. The opportunity to move from vocational qualifications to university is already a good feature of our system. And in fact, we have 100,000 BTEC students applying for university every year, and the number's growing. A quarter of the people starting at university in any given year will do so with a vocational qualification, and UCAS predict that this could rise to a third very quickly. Of vocational students that go to university, 40% come from the lowest socio-economic groups. The corresponding figure for A-level students is 20%. So it's a really important pathway. But the application figures are only one indicator of social progress. Equally important is how well young people <coughs> succeed and secure well-paid jobs and reach their full potential. And they do, and they do. I'm optimistic too. Over half get a first or a 2-1 and over 90% get a 2-2 or above. Now this is not quite as high as their A-level counterparts, but it's pretty close. So not only do they come from an, a vocational route, they really do succeed in an academic environment. And to be clear, thousands of vocational students are attending Russell Group universities too. And it's great again to see that this trend is growing. But the picture is not perfect, as the report points out. More vocational <coughs> students drop out than we would like. And we're working on this with universities and colleges. The number is coming down, but it remains too high. And in fact, with our new developments of vocational, we're looking at what else can we build into the qualification itself to make sure students are prepared for their next steps. For us, it's not enough that students leave with a piece of paper. We are not doing them justice if we don't ensure they can go somewhere with that and that that has currency. So overall, for our vocational students, we've got data that they do really well in teamwork, in communications, project skills, independent study. They actually do really well at that. Universities report that back. But in terms of exam techniques, being able to really study in an academic way, that's not as strong for vocational students. So we are changing the way we are assessing vocational students in the future, and we'll be introducing greater rigor into some aspects of our assessment. And that's to make sure when they leave us with the qualification, they can go on to do whatever they want, because the doors will be open. So it's really important we take that responsibility as an awarding body that we give them the best chance. So with all that in mind, um, can we learn anything from the other jurisdictions that have been mentioned? Well, I, I think we can, and I'd like to just take a moment to talk about Singapore. Lots of people do talk about Singapore, so I'm sure many of you know more about Singapore than I do. But their approach to vocational study is an impressive one. They do already have a system where they've established bridges and ladders so that people can go down the vocational pathway but later cross to the academic route, or vice versa. And actually, I suppose one of the features they have that's slightly different, um, we don't have necessarily higher education institutions that really just focus on technical or truly applied qualifications, which other jurisdictions do. So there's something about our structure that's different in higher education. The system in Singapore also ensures that people are not forced down a narrow route too early, but they have the chance to change, especially as they mature and their ambitions become clearer. They understand that young people do learn things different, in different ways and at different points. I don't think we fully take that on board in all our educational areas. And in Singapore, unlike the UK, most young people do opt for the practical route. They don't go down the academic route. They go for the practical route. They leave their options open. 
And one of the advantages in Singapore is that the vocational route is as highly regarded and understood as the academic route. And again, I think we have work to do here to make sure that's true in England and the UK as well. And let's remember that you know, the academic achievement of those in Singapore is very high. So the vocational route is not for those less able, for those disadvantaged or those that haven't yet achieved. They make their decisions based on what they want to do in the future. So I'd like to thank Alan and the commissioners for shining a, a, a really much needed light on all the issues in the report. And critically, they are challenging us, all of us in education, I think, to look again about what are we doing. It's certainly been a focus inside Pearson about where are we positioning all the things we do in education to make sure we open doors and help learners progress. That is what we're all about. But I'd also like to add, you know, we are in the middle of unprecedented educational reforms. And therefore, teachers that we've talked about and their um, ongoing CPD and how able they are, at the moment, I think many are feeling overwhelmed by the sheer weight of change. And perhaps when these settle down, we'll have more time with them to reflect on how we should develop good uh, curricula and also the vocational and academic routes. But it's a timely reminder at the moment that we do need to continue to develop a system. You know, we've got quite a bit of fragmentation in our system compared with other jurisdictions. Some of that freedom is good. You know, we've, we've seen academy chains that have excelled and brought um, uh, a different way of, of teaching. But some of that may actually slightly fragment the system that is not broken and working at the moment. So I think we do need a system that reinforces and absolutely recognises the vocational ladder that gives individual currency in the global economy. We are looking at how vocational is locally responsive, but I think although that is absolutely really important for our economy and for young people and employability, it is important also that we keep a nationally recognised and accepted route to bright futures and don't end up with, if you like, higher education and employers not understanding what young people are bringing when they come along with their experience or their qualifications. So I just think we need to keep one eye on making sure we do have a cohesive system. So I think we can achieve Alan's vision. We may not go about it in the same way and not everything in the recommendations may be taken forward, but we certainly hope, Alan, we continue to work with you on this. So thank you. Fantastic. Well, look, three, three fantastic contributions uh, opening it up to the floor now. We've got time for some Q&A. Uh, can I make my perennial request for short, sharp yes. questions, please, rather than statements or speeches? Uh, and can you say who you are and who you're representing, please? Uh, so, yes, there's a mic coming around. So, the gentleman there and then the gentleman there after that. And we'll take them in pairs. Thank you to all three speakers. Uh, Joe Dilger, Educational Governance Consultant, ex-Head of Governance for Oasis Academies. Uh, just picking up on the points on governors, and just really to ask Alan firstly, you, you highlighted uneven distribution of success in... Sorry. Sorry, uh, yeah, Alan there highlighted uneven distribution of success, different schools in the same area serving similar populations. Any learnings for governors and governing bodies from them? And just a second very quick point to Lizzie, I think there's plenty of, I train governing bodies, plenty of good governance resources out there already, DFE Governors Handbook and Ofsted Data Dashboard just need to be trained in it if they're not using them. Thank you. Hi, uh, Matt Hickman from the Wellcome Trust. Um, you spoke about schools there primarily and understand why. Only about 20% of a young person's time is spent in school at the height of their education. Um, the summer learning gap is a significant issue, and particularly, obviously, for the disadvantaged. So just curious about the role you think of that, of the out-of-school out opportunity. Sure. Okay, uh, let's take those. So, Alan first. So, on governors, I think the, the um, <laughs> usual metaphor I was thinking of in my head, um, they're the sort of dog that hasn't barked, so to speak. So, I think they are, I mean, look, they can be a really good, they can be a force for good. Um, and very often, I think they, ca they are. Um, and this is where I sort of disagree with, with the Lizzie point, because, look, the truth is about our education system that it's a mixed ability class. Okay? Within schools, there are mixed abilities. 
And schools are a mixed ability class. Some have got it, some haven't. Some have got really good leadership, some haven't. And I don't, honestly don't think it's good enough for national government to say, that's got nothing to do with us. Uh, uh, and if you want an exemplar in a different area of public policy, have a look at the consequences of Mr. Lansley's reform in the, reforms in the National Health Service. It's got nothing to do with us, politics out of it, over to you guys, and by the way, you've got chaos. Um, now, I'm not saying that that's where we're going in education, but the idea that government and the state doesn't have a role is, seems to me to be an erroneous one. Nor do I believe, as I was saying in my contribution, that you want the state all over this, or necessarily that some of the national infrastructure, including national pay bargaining, work. So, as with all things in life, I mean, I guess I would say this, there is a third way. Um, so, uh, and I sort of continue, I mean, one of the few believes it. Uh, so, uh, there we are, maybe it'll come back into vogue, you never know, eventually. Um, um, so, so, I sort of think that, that, there is, that it is right to gift autonomy, but it is also right to gift support. And the critical thing that any government can do is to gift clarity and to gift time for change. So we are in the middle of some big changes. People want to know fundamentally where it is that they're supposed to be going and what it is that they're supposed to be doing. And I'm not sure right now that if you are, to coin an Alistair Campbellism, a bog standard governor, that you really know the answer to that question. And so, and so they can be a very powerful driver for change, not least because they hold some accountabilities over head teachers and leadership teams w within schools. So I think to, to Lizzie's point, I do agree that the direction and the guidance that governors get seems to me to be a really important missing part, part of the jigsaw. So I think that is absolutely right. On your point, Matt, yes, absolutely. I think there is now good and compelling evidence. Look, we know that the reason I was sort of stealing some money from the widening participation budgets for one of my, one of my um, proposals is that we know that we're spending a lot on widening participation to ensure that more kids from a diverse range of backgrounds get into university. Um, uh, bizarrely, for, for, for universities which have got more research capability within their four walls than anywhere in, that you can imagine in the country, there doesn't seem to be any evidence base whatsoever for how we spend £700 million worth of public money. Um, the bit of evidence that does seem to be firmly established is that continuity in relationship between a university and a school really makes a difference. One-to-one -one really makes a difference. In other words, my relationship with you as a pupil. And thirdly, summer schools, when structured in the right way, when structured in the right way, can make a profound difference, particularly for the most disadvantaged students. So, you know, we're going to be in, we're in an age of austerity. Whoever wins the next general election is going to be faced with some difficult choices. They should always be prioritizing the things, the policies that give the biggest social mobility bang for the buck. That's the world that we're now in. And, uh, and that might point towards more, not less, of precisely the, the, the sort of initiatives that you're advocating. Okay, so Lizzie, question on governance and also the question on is it good enough to just leave schools to it? Uh, um, leave, leave schools to, to, the, to the university? No, it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I agree, with, I agree with the point on governorship, and I think there's, there's, there's plenty of um, concern in, inside the Department of Education, and well, certainly was last year, that, that, that governors have a huge amount, huge responsibility, and they, they're just simply they're not, it's not because they are not very capable professional people, they're just simply not quite equipped with the knowledge to ask the right questions. So, and I think it's, you know, it is very important, just as you sit on any board as a non-executive, that you really get into the deep questions and understand what is going on, and I think, you know, the rest of the situation in Birmingham or anywhere else is partly to do with, it, with governance and to do with getting into the detail of what is, how a school is being run and how you can help support the improvement of that school. I mean, I think Alan and I have got on, onto a sort of false sort of track of, of, of you being allowed to get on and do what you want and uh, being sort of uh, micromanaged by centrally, and neither is true, of course, because in the middle of this we have something called Ofsted, which really manages schools, regardless of what central state or everybody else says. And Ofsted has a very clear uh, remit, and if a school is 
And I'd be glad, and one of the things we, we I hope we'll get onto is one of the gaps we've got at the moment is, is schools requiring improvement will now be asked to very quickly uh, put a school improvement plan together. So there is, there's both analysis and support, and those two things need to happen. Uh, and that happens, that has been happening, uh, we've obviously said very well with, with schools that are failing, we're now going to move further into the middle tier, which I think is, is very, very important. Uh, on, on your point about, um, on, on your point about out of school, sorry, I, I, was, I, was, I literally couldn't hear what you said. What sorry. was your question? I couldn't hear what was it. What was it? It was more to do with the fact that uh, a lot of time young people spend is not in school, it's out of school, so what about all the other influences on them to aid social mobility? Was this to do with Ofsted? Measuring other things as well as, well as assess, assessing on performance? No, not particularly, but just that uh, the young people from disadvantaged backgrounds have fewer books in their houses and things like that. You know, there, there's a huge other aspect of things going on that the school is less able to influence. And is it better to think about education as an ecosystem rather than just putting all the resources into the schools? Well, I, I, my, 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 colleague, my colleague from Oasis, who, who asked the question about governors, would say, I suspect in Oasis schools, that there is a community support professional who is really looking at the whole people, not just the people as they arrive in the morning and what they do while they're at school, but what's going on at home, what other resources and, and assets can be brought to bear to improve the life chances of that child. So it, 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 when, you, when you start visiting schools, you start seeing the habits of highly successful, well-run schools, and they're broadly the same, which is the people is looked at as part of the and, and it works very well. It doesn't always work, but it works very well in very successful schools. Okay, great. We're running a little bit short time, so we're just going to have to take two more quick questions, uh, and then we'll have to finish it up. So the woman on the front row there, and then the woman right by the window at the back there. Thank you. Hi, um, Diane Bertrand from Creative Education Academies Trust. Um, I just picked up on Alan's point um, where you mentioned the shocking statistic um, about teachers uh, and their views of, of those from disadvantaged backgrounds, um, you know, ach achieving less than their peers. Um, but then you also emphasise the need for data and for the, you know, to assess the pupil premium gap. And I think Lizzie mentioned that as well. So I was just wondering, by emphasising that and analysing it and focusing on it, is that not bringing it to more teachers' attention and hence could create more self-fulfilling prophecies? Sure. Okay. Yeah. And then at the back there by the window. Hi, Susanna from the Educational Charity Action Tutoring. Um, Lizzie, I think you mentioned that actually the 5A to C GCSE benchmark is incredibly low um, as a threshold anyway. We've talked a lot today about expectations, but it sounds to me like maybe there's more work to be done around raising national expectations um, for disadvantaged pupils to up that bar of the 5A to Cs and just would be interested to get the wider panel's view on that. Okay, great. So two, two related questions. So let's go Lizzie, then Ellen, and then Leslie, and then we'll have to, we'll have to finish it then. Um, uh, well, I think that's, that's a perfectly point. I think that's about, I think, that, I think it's, it's, it's not a problem yet, but I think it's worth raising. I think I totally agree. I think, I think I talk about 100%. I do not see why 100% isn't possible. Okay, Alan? So let me just deal with the first point. So I think there's data is an empowering tool, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think the more fundamental problem is might be amongst a minority of teachers a mindset issue. Okay, so we have to be candid about that. So you've got to, you've, you know, data helps you to win an argument, but you've also got to have an argument. Okay, and that's sort of, I guess, slightly what I'm doing, which is you've got to have an argument about every teacher having a responsibility to treat, treat every child in a way that maximizes the ability of that child to succeed, okay, universally and equally. Um, and, 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 and so there is some stuff that you can do in process terms. So we know that teachers tend to, in the deployment of their staff, they tend to deploy the better teachers to the more go-ahead group of kids. So one thing that they can do is think about a modest form of redistribution. I mean, I know redistribution's old-fashioned and so on, but let's, you know, let's go with it and let's think about how we can actually redistribute the human resource so that it's targeted on lifting the bottom and not just improving the top. So there's some stuff that you've got to do, but the thing starts with what do you really believe? And I think we've got to, we've got to have an argument with the teaching profession in general about what it is that we expect as a society from every one of our teachers and not just the, the, the majority. I think on, on your point, absolutely. So yesterday I spent uh, a morning in, in Peter Hyman's free school, 
um, again, in Newham. And the thing that really struck me above all else was, was what was being expected of the kids, of the students. And the expectations were, I texted Peter afterwards and said, this is what, this is what education should be, okay? Because the, the, the stretch was a phenomena. I mean, you know, four-year-old kids who were being asked to do things that in any other school you would ask an eight or nine or ten-year-old to do, and by the way, they were doing it, you know, from Newham, you know, from Newham. This is not Islington, this is Newham. So, so, so you're absolutely right. And so if we can go further and we can go faster, absolutely. And part of the job of whoever has the joy of being the secondary state for education on May the 8th or June the 9th or when it's all sorted out um, is foot to the accelerator, right? What, what do you think of, just jumping in there, what do you think of free schools, Alan, and their, their role in this? You're tempting me to, 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 to luckily it's, uh, look, it's, you know, I'm personally, I'm pretty supportive. Um, I mean, the test for me is, the test for me is one of both input and outcome. So, so if they are serving the right pupils in the right areas, and the evidence seems to be somewhat mixed that that is the case, if they are doing that, and if critically they're achieving what I think we're all here to try to achieve, which is an improvement in performance overall and a narrowing in the gap, then that is a good thing, not a bad thing. But for me, it is conditional on that. Very good, thank you, I'll Leslie. I'll just take the uh, targets, uh, the five A to C, because uh, I talk to heads, and some of the best heads ignore any target that's laid down by anybody, whether that's Ofsted, uh, the, the government and just do what's right they believe for individual children and in those schools they usually exceed all those targets anyway and I think I do worry sometimes that we do focus too much on targets because then you're trying to reach the target as opposed to exceed a target sure. so that's great that we can do a measurement about how many have got five A to C's but if you want to go into employment or you want to go on actually you need more than that so nobody should be targeting five A's to C. It's just the basic measure that other people use to measure schools. I don't think we should. It is a question for me if you hit the target but you miss the point and there's more, more that we should be doing. Very good. Well, listen, thank you all so much indeed. Thank you to Alan, to Lisley and to Leslie for a fantastic event. Thank you to Pearson for sponsoring it and thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you.